Good evening, everybody from Singapore. Today I'm with Tahira. Hello. And we are together in Singapore for our day four of our Catalonia, the Secrets Beyond Barcelona campaign, which has been taking you all week throughout Catalonia. You have been exploring all corners of this region of Spain in the north, in the northeast. And today it's all about food, food and wine, which, by the way, I have <laughs> right next to me. So later on, we're going to talk all about wine. But first, we're going to talk all about food. And today we have an amazing program that's going to be super cool and super exciting for all of you. So firstly, we are going to La Bucaria Market in Barcelona. And then after that, we're going to talk about food and we're going to learn about traditional Catalan breakfasts. And after that, we are going to continue with a winery tour of Familia Torres wines. But in between those things, Tahira and I are going to show you how to make two extremely simple Catalan dishes. And that is pan tomàquet and escalivada. So today's program, as you probably know, we are on day four. So today, as I was telling you, is all about Catalan gastronomy and cuisine. So food, wine, and everything that we love doing in Catalonia, which is to eat and to drink and to be with friends. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm glad we're here to get together today and we're going to show you guys some simple things like bar mentioned and also share with you the goods from local insiders in catalonia absolutely so we're going to start with a bit of an overview of catalan gastronomy and if you're going to join us in making pan tomaca this is your chance to go and get the ingredients so you're ready for when we are showing you how you just need very simple things bread tomato, olive oil, and salt. And that's all you will need. And in a few minutes, we are going to show you how to make this very simple Catalan recipe yourself. So go and get the ingredients. On Monday, we told you all about Catalonia and how to plan your trip. And one of the things that we talked about was the fact that in Catalonia, we have more than 60 Michelin stars. And that is on many restaurants, including a couple in the past and nowadays that have been considered the best restaurant in the world. Two times Al Saleh de Can Roca and five times Al Bulli were picked, were top of the list of 50 world's best restaurants. And because of that, and because we have great ingredients to start with, we are able to have amazing chefs that put together super exciting food and also the simplest recipes like the one that we're going to show you today. And we have such great gastronomy all around Catalonia that we have all these super great chefs that make these beautiful dishes that we have on the screen and that you can even find them on Netflix. So if you have Netflix or even Amazon Prime, you will be able to see lots of these uh, programs that are showing you Catalan cuisine, the story of some of the chefs, including the Rocker Brothers or Al Bulli. And these are some of the ones that, uh, that Tahira wanted to highlight, right? Yeah, so in Chef's Table Season 4, we have Jordi Roca, who was best patissier in the world in 2015, and also has his own restaurant in Girona City, which we will go to tomorrow. And he has invented some of the most exquisite dishes that play with all of your senses. So not just your tongue but your sense of sight smell touch and it's incredible the dishes he talks about in um, chef's table and one of it that really blew my mind is the one of the dish that breathes so basically the food on your table is usually not alive but the dish on that plate was moving and i think mar is going to show you a quick video of that we have a video of, uh, of the Rocker Brothers speaking, mm -hmm. right, which we want to show you um, just now. So have a look at this because it's a really beautiful video that explains the story of these three brothers that have Al Salida de Can Roca, which was crowned best restaurant in the world twice uh, and is now including the Hall of Fame of 50 World's Best. And one of them is uh, an awarded sommelier. One of them is the head chef and the other one is the, is the patissier. So the three of them make this amazing restaurant. So have a look at this video that we have for you. De què té gust Catalunya? Segurament té gust el seu paisatge. A l'Ebre, a l'Empordà, als Pirineus, que dona tant de si, que és tan inspirador. Però també té gust sofregits, picades, a mar i muntanyes, salats i dolços. Com deia Pla, la cuina és el paisatge portat a la cassola. Sempre ens ha seduït la idea de menjar-se el paisatge. Aquest espai tan nostre, que ha donat caràcter i essència al nostre poble. No sabíem qui som sense els fruits de la nostra terra. Per un cuiner la terra és la identitat, és l'autenticitat, és la possibilitat de poder mostrar a través de la cuina, que és un llenguatge, mostrar històries. Per avançar, 
primer s'ha adquirit el coneixement del passat. Nosaltres ho hem après tot de la mare. Catalunya ha donat molta diversitat a través dels seus llibres i del seu llegat, també d'aquestes tradicions properes. Tot això configura la cuina del celler Can Roca. Tenim la sort, com a cuiners que cuinem en aquest territori, que que tenim productes extraordinaris, no? I, per tant, el producte pot ser, i de fet és, un punt de partida importantíssim, que dona peu a plats extraordinaris. Que com seria la nostra cuina si no haguéssim nascut a Catalunya? Sempre hem estat envoltats de gent que ens ve a veure amb il·lusió. Es deixen portar, que nosaltres podem provocar i jugar. I amanir una vetllada en la qual hi ha gent que comenta que per a ells això és un espectacle la gent ens regala el seu temps i ve amb les mans obertes. No podem decebre'ls. A què té gust Catalunya? Tasta'ns. So how about that? So inspiring. I've actually had the chance to meet the three Rocker brothers and they are so oh. humble. I am so jealous right now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you had the chance to meet them. Well, it would be amazing to go to the restaurant which is booked Years booked, in advance. Uh, yeah, in advance. So yeah, it's a chance in a lifetime and everybody should try once. Yes. And tomorrow we're going to see their ice cream shop. Yeah. The ice cream shop of the brother who is uh, the, the, the dessert uh, and the patissier. And we're going to go and visit his ice cream shop, which is in Girona as part of tomorrow's tour. But today it's all about food and wine. And here you have some typical Catalan dishes, which you probably heard us talk about on Monday. Uh, these are some of my favorite. Today, it's all about pan tomacat. You're going to, by the end of today, you're definitely going to know what pan tomacat is. And and how it's made and that's the one in the middle right the one with the bread and the tomatoes and we are going to show it to you ourselves Tahira will make it and we'll show you and then we have the two videos that we're going to play for you today which are a gastronomy a talk and a tour of uh, Torres Winery we'll also be showing you how to make pan tomacat this is how much and how typical of Catalonia it is the other one is something that you probably heard before many times which is aioli which is basically al e oli which in catalan translates to garlic and olive oil and that's essentially what it is it's a sauce that is a bit like a mayonnaise that you may have tried in play other places around the world because you can find it on many menus but it's traditionally a catalan um, sauce that you would eat with fideua which is similar to a paella but made with short noodles and other dishes uh, for example grilled meats right and the other things is crema catalana which is very similar to the french creme brulee that's a very typical catalan dish as well and the one on the top right is escachada which is basically a cod salad salted cod salad with tomato and some black olives that is very typical um for the summer right because it's fresh and you know it's just like very great and as you can see all catalan dishes are very simple i mean in fact Two of the dishes on the screen right now, or almost the third one even, is made of two ingredients only. So <laughs> it's quite impressive how simple it is, right? Yep. But doesn't mean it's not wholesome and delicious. So. Yeah, it's super good and very healthy, right? So, I mean, what can I tell you, right? And then we have our own five favorite dishes, right, on the next slide. These are my favorite Catalan foods. When I go home, this is what I always eat first. And I've been away from Spain for 16 years now. But when I go back home, my mother always asks me, what is it that I can make for you? And I always tell her the same thing, pan tomacat and potato omelette, which is what you can see on the left, which is basically an omelette made with potatoes and onions. Pan tomacat you will hear about later. And the one on the right is a very traditional, very unique Catalan food, which is calçots. It's these long onions that look very much like a, like a leek, a leek, oh, yeah. like a leek, right? Like, and then you basically uh, grill them on a barbecue on an open fire, you char the outside and then you eat it by like, pressing at the bottom and pulling from the middle. So you have the tender bits in the middle, which are the ones you can see on the picture. And you eat it with romesco sauce, which is this sauce here made with peppers, almonds, and a, tip, a very specific type of red pepper that you can only find in Catalonia <laughs> that is dried, it's all dried, and then you need to like rehydrate it a little bit and then like scrape the, the, the middle of the peppers with it. And with that, you make this sauce that again has become quite a hipster thing. Like <laughs> you can find it pretty much in a lot of the places around the world to accompany all sorts of food, not just calzots. Yep. And Tahira also has her favorites from her trips. For me, something we're going to try today is escalivada. This is such a simple dish that we can have just made from aubergines, red peppers, onions, or any kind of vegetables that you want to grill for the day. And it's so healthy because it's just olive oil and salt. 
old and I love that it's so fresh. So it's something I do and keep from the start of the week to the end and it's a good way to get your nutrients in, which is one of the best Mediterranean takeaways for me from working for the Catalan Tourist Board. And also Aros Negri, which is black rice made from squid egg and creating a sofrito made with onions and caramelizing it over a pan like a, a paella pan and adding like seafood like mussels or prawns and for me this is something that reminds me of the mediterranean sea and i, I really love that and the last thing is something so simple but i mean i put cheese and there are so many varieties of cheese which we will learn from alex and saska later on but cheese is something so typical right like cow cheese sheep cheese goat cheese and for someone who came from asia just learning about those different cheese and the taste was mind-blowing so. yes i think in asia for those of you who are watching and i always ask you and today i forgot i always ask you to say hi and tell me where you are because i love hearing about where everybody is and you know we've been having people watching from all over the world in the last in the last few days but i please tell me where you are but if you're from asia cheese is not something that's very common now that i've been living in singapore for so many years i realize right cheese here is not something that's very common and so it's quite interesting to hear the here saying how much she loves cheese and yeah and it's not easy to find catalan cheese outside of spain, spain right yes so we've been struggling to find matter. it yeah yeah so you're for that matter yes absolutely so before we go live to Lavucaria, which is where we have Anna ready to take us on a tour of Lavucaria, I have a very short video on the foods through the seasons because what is very important about catalan cuisine is that we eat what's in season you're not gonna eat salad in the winter because lettuce doesn't grow in the winter and so you're just not gonna eat it. And so we always eat what's in season. And so when it's in season, it's just better, right? It's just ripe, it's just more flavorful. It, it's not imported from anywhere. I grew up eating what's around me, right? Like, and I grew up in the countryside. So my father lives in the countryside and we have a small garden and we grow all sorts of vegetables. And when it's the season, you eat what's, what the land will give you, right? And so that's why in La Bucaria now, you're gonna see um, you know, what sorts Seasonal of vegetables produce. and fruits are in season right now yeah. for the summertime. And before we do that, we have a short video that shows you the food through the months um, so that you can have an appreciation for what to expect every month that you come to Catalonia. <music> So what did you all think? Did you recognize any of the dishes? I think that what's amazing about Catalan food is how simple it is. And now we're going to go to La Bucaria. So we're going to welcome Anna and Grace. Hello, ladies. Hi, Anna. Hi, Grace. Hi. Hi Hello. Yes. Good. Good, and you? you? We're fine, thank you. We've been seeing all these images of food that you were explaining, and, and they were amazing. Like, actually, we had Spanish omelette for lunch. <laughs> no, so you did? Amazing. Good, I'm so jealous. jealous. Oh my God, I'm so jealous. <laughs> yeah, and we were commenting about salsa because um, actually uh, it's something that you either hate or love. So I love them, but I don't like them. <laughs> really? Oh no. Yeah. Can you not like salsa? I mean, it's all about the performance, right? As, uh, as we will see later when we go to, to Torres, I think that's also what Mark, the speaker, tells. Eating salsa is about the performance. You need to wear the bib and you need to eat with your hands and, you know, and the dirtier you get, the better they taste. Yes, it's about getting dirty. <laughs> Absolutely. So, ladies, you are in La Rambla, in front of La Bucaria yes. Market, is it? Yeah, so um, we are going to show it to you, like we are going to change the camera and okay, you will see awesome. where we are. I'm yeah. sure that everybody is very familiar with this entrance that you're going to show us now, with this entrance of La Bucaria Market, which is today extremely quiet without the tourists. Yeah, and that's such a good day, right? Like, very beautiful. super sunny, proper spring day, very nice, it's getting hot, so perfect weather. Beautiful. Absolutely. So let's 
it's walking and let's see what's on offer, no? Let's have a look around La Bucaria in this yeah, privileged yeah, yeah. moment where it's like empty of tourists and just locals doing their grocery shopping. Yeah, and actually what's um, maybe a bit um, uncommon is that now it's around 3.30 p.m., like not 3.30 yet, but it's lunchtime in Catalonia. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's weird it's for people who are listening to us. But yes, people here eat very late. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, You're um, very right. Lunchtime is not Actually, uh, the proper name of this market is uh, San Joseph's Market. Since it was built uh, on, like, over the monastery of San Joseph. But it got the name of La Bucaria with the time. Because La Bucaria means uh, butcher. Yes. And, and now it's become a very like tourist popular attraction. It has the beautiful entrance with the stained glass that you were just showing us. And inside it's an explosion yeah. of colors and smells and you know everything. So there's a lot of fruits and vegetables stalls. There's also like um, nuts and cookies and small sweets. So if you go, for example, in, in, to this main hall, you will see mostly food, but if you go around, you will see also tapas places and people eating right now. Um, there's a bar variety of dishes that you can try if you come here. So yeah, you can find like different gastronomic experiences which are like really nice. Amazing. Let's have a look. You're making yeah. me so hungry. Plus everything is so colorful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And really so If you look around here, you can also see like the vegetables, like as you said before, my uh, season vegetables such as um, beans and also onions. You can also see tomatoes, lemons, and um, a fruit that is very special, very seasonal right now. It's strawberry. Uh, strawberries, it's, yes. Yeah, it's the, May is around when strawberry season uh, starts, so it's very, very special. And yes, if you maybe not in Barcelona, but if you go around there, uh, region next to Barcelona, which is uh, Maresma, and if you go there, they have the best strawberries ever. Mm. Yes, that's where the strawberries are grown, the Maresma yeah. region, which is surrounding Barcelona, right? Mm. So it's just outside the city. And yes, you're absolutely right. In May is the season for strawberries. Um, so yes, they must be so delicious. Oh my God. Could we see some vegetables up close? I'm curious to know whether there are different kinds of yeah, like sure. strawberries like and tomatoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tahira so so is always mesmerized by the yeah, many like different types of tomatoes some, we yeah. have in Catalonia. Like you got like yeah. these strawberries here. This is maybe like the first of the season. They look oh, like nice and big, and yeah. I'm sure they're super fit. Yeah. So juicy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if, if we look around, there's a lot of stalls that start having like at least small packages of strawberries, but like with the time they will get like bigger as that box because they're like the um, they get like a lot of strawberries. Yeah. Mm. I hope you're going to buy some before leaving the market. Yeah, so if we move a little, like, up front, so all these stalls are closed because they usually open very, very early in the morning. Those are, like, fish stalls, maybe also um, meat stalls, since, like, the fish comes very, very early in the morning. So they are usually open, like, in the first hours of the day, and then they close at midday. Right. But we can yes. see some of them. Because the fish comes from, from the port in Barcelona. I mean, Barcelona is a, is a sea-facing city and all the ports nearby, right? So yeah, all the fishermen... Yeah, we are very close to the beach. If you follow Las Ramblas uh, down to the port, you can get to the sea. So you have you see here, like, the last seafood and fish of the day. The fish are, like, the fish stalls are already closing, wrapping up. Oh, look at this, like, lobster. big crayfish and lobster. Wow. And the langoustines. Wow. Langoustines yeah. are, like, we have so many, like, Langoustine different types of prawns. Lobsters, right? No, mm. langoustines are, like, the bigger prawns. Oh, okay. Yeah, come here. You will see them. Yes, I think we need to have a look at the prawns and the langoustines because it's a very traditional yeah, so thing. These are, like, uh, very like red. A prawn, but these are, like, yagusti, which is, like, bigger. Can you, can you compare them? Mm. Yeah, it's bigger than the prawns, but smaller than a lobster. Yeah, and this is also very good. And they are so yummy and so fresh. Yeah, you can eat them just off the sea with salt and toasting over the... Yeah, we just grill them quickly, exactly. You just grill them with nice olive oil and a little bit of salt. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love seafood. So yeah, much fresh seafood. Yeah, there's a lot of seafood. different seafood here. Oh, pardon, Mark? Yeah, so much seafood. I mean, it's just like so fresh and so beautiful. 
Yes, yes, yes. Hola. Do you think we can find one of the store, one of the butchers that sells like uh, ambutits, like cured meats? Oh and yeah, we can go one of those. Yeah, like I believe there were like a couple of them at the entrance. So just let's go back to the entrance. Let's have a look and try because to find one. I mean, if uh, for all of you that are watching us, uh, if you have any request for oh, Anna to show you anything, so this is like we can play a game. We can uh, we can tell Anna where to go. I think it would be great to see all the ambutits, all the cured meats, because it's a very typically Catalan thing. And later on, Tahir and I are going to eat some. And I'm, uh, we're going to show you how to make a beautiful Catalan sandwich with nice cured meat. Um, but it's just like such a treat to see all the different cured meats that we have. We have so many. Yeah, so if you look here. Yeah, so this is chorizo, which is like, it's, um, how would you say, it, it's bigger. But then you have like the, I don't know if they have crumbs here. There's like uh, fuet, which is like, it's, it's like um, some kind of, uh, it's a pyramid, which is like, it has a, a large and thin shape. And usually what you do is you just cut it, like with a knife, in tiny pieces, and you just eat them. And for example, mm -hmm. my yes. boyfriend loves them. And every time he comes to my house, the first thing he goes to is fritz and fuet. All the time. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah fuet is like a thin cured sausage. And now we can just keep looking for it. It's so empty, right? It's so quiet yeah. right now yeah. without any tourists. Oh, yeah. I feel like we have such a privileged view. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, so Tahira, here's pleasure for your eyes. All the oh, jeez. Oh, sorry, I'm really shouting. <laughs> so much cheese. Oh, Cheap dear. cheese, cow I love, cheese. I love, oh God, goat cheese from Carrocha. The black pepper one is really something else for me. Oh, so yeah. much cheese. And mato. I can't oh, even fresh cheese, yes, mato. Fresh cheese. Mato is like a fresh cheese, right? Yeah, like How a cottage cheese, like a similar, like and a cottage cheese. And usually, bread would look like this, but it's covered in a wine in um like a layer so it protects like from from the outside and you can yes. feel it and there's people who just eat it yeah i just eat the the, the skin of the web <laughs> yeah Delicious. so what else do you want to see so let's have a look at the fruit at the vegetables i think that tahira really oh, wants yeah, to yeah, see yeah. the tomatoes so many tomatoes because the last time i was in barcelona oh, yeah. i noticed that the tomatoes oh so my variants. look at this Oh, we look at how many like tomatoes. Special tomatoes. So those are used for pan tomatan, and those are the. They usually come in a branch, such as like these tiny tomatoes here. They usually like are fed like this. Yeah. But they got just removed from the branch, and they're just selling them like this. Yes. But those are the pan tomatan tomatoes. They are yes. smaller, but they are very very juicy. Yes, these tomatoes are amazing. And we're going to show you pam tomacat because today I think the theme is pam tomacat. And we are going to make you some pam tomacat, mm. which you make yeah. with those tomatoes, which you cannot find outside of Catalonia. Even in Catalonia, it's kind of hard to find them. Nowadays, it's a bit more common, but you have to go to like a market. Supermarkets don't really carry them so easily. Do you think they, yeah. will, have a, and they will have the noya, the one you Oh, to... noras. No, I don't think they'll have noras. Mm. No, I don't think they either. It's unlikely. And actually, my when what we can see here is like the variety of tomatoes we got here. Like, I'm a yes. like personally, I'm a tomato lover, and <laughs> like they all taste different, and yeah. they are like used for different purposes. So you would use this, the bigger ones for salad, mm. and it, depending on which one you get, it gets like sweeter or maybe it's more like juicier or um, maybe uh, sour, so it, it depends on the flavor of each tomato, but they are like, they are great here. Yes, absolutely. And having, li having, li uh, having lived abroad, mm -hmm. it's so amazing, the difference between the fruit abroad and the fruit here. Yeah, yes, sure. everything is so much tastier in Catalonia, I agree with you. <laughs> what, about, um, what about like a colmado or one of the places that sells olives? One of the stores oh, that yeah, has the big find range one of, of those, olives. But most of them are closed. Let's try to look around. They probably close for lunch as well, right? Because these are would be the yeah. ones that would be closed for the would be open for the afternoon. Uh, okay, let's find something. Wow, oh, look at this one with everything. So many fruits. Yeah, yeah. It's some vegetables. Wow. More tomatoes. And here there's bread. 
Bread, yes, bread. I mean, the other ingredient. The bread that we've got in here. Yes, amazing bread. I could live off bread and tomatoes, to be honest. Like, literally. <laughs> So I don't think we can find a, a colmado around. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. What about the Maybe because all of them are closed? The tapas places where people will be having lunch. Yeah, those are tapas places and you can find several around the market. So if you just like around La Ramblas and feel hungry, you can just come inside and have some food. Yes, what how amazing, right? And everything must be coming from the market. So I mean it's literally market to table. Mm. So yeah, you also have like different varieties. Oh, you see, that's what. Fuet, yes. Fuet and yunganisa and ham. I see the big ham in there, all the ham hanging. And all the different nice, types right? of stuff. Oh, come here. Let's see, what yes. have you found? I don't know if we may be able to find all this around here, but I'm not that sure. Mm, no, that's pate. You know what pate and foie are? So there's like so many varieties here. Yeah, like foie. <laughs> what do What do we drink no, in the morning? We drink. Actually, you're going to see. What do we? What do you drink in the morning, Anna? When I wake up. Yeah, somebody's asking. I am in the morning in the US and I'm, I'm having I'm watching with a cup of coffee. What do people in Catalonia drink for breakfast? Um, usually either water or uh, yeah, um, maybe milk with cocoa. Also um, coffee. A lot of people have coffee in the morning or tea. I'm a I'm a tea person. Yeah. Coffee with milk, right? It's a pickle later. Yeah, or cortado. Yes, right? Cortado is a really nice Spanish thing. Con cortado, yes. That's what we drink in the morning. Which is a little bit of milk and a larger amount of coffee yeah. in the glass. Yes. Yeah. The cortado is an espresso with a little bit of milk. Yeah, if you want to have something yeah, quicker, actually, you drink that. Huh. And it's very particular how each person, how everybody's got their own way of having their own, their coffee. So, for example, my grandpa would uh, drink his coffee like black chart short coffee in a small cup, but my grandma would have like no coffee, uh, no caffeine, sugar, and a bit of milk. So yeah, it, it's completely different style. Yeah. And also, you know, if you feel so inclined, you can have a carajillo, which is basically a coffee with a little <laughs> bit of cognac or brandy or whiskey, like some liquor in the morning, like, you know, like people go get into the bar, like the corner bar, sit at the bar, order a coffee and a carajillo, and then they'll literally get the espresso and then the guy will bring out the bottle of brandy and pour until you say <laughs> enough. And then, you know, you drink it. Yes, yes, yes. I remember right. when I was younger, I used to um, work at the bar. And after lunch, a lot of people would ask for a carajillo. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> and what do you put in it? You put brandy, you know, you put like a, like Torres 5 or something. Yeah, you would put brandy or either Baileys. Baileys. Baileys, yes. A carajillo de Baileys. Oh my God, yes. That's absolutely the way to go. An espresso with a little bit of Baileys instead of milk. I think that this way you start the day with the best way. So I hope that we have given you lots of ideas for how we start the day in Catalonia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I see so many colorful stalls behind you. Amazing, all the fruits, Anna. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, we are not finding any olives, but no worries. Maybe you come here and in another time, like maybe earlier or later on the day. So, yeah. No problem. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for giving us a little tour of La, of La Bucaria. It's been super nice to see it, also because it's a very special time now that uh, Barcelona is still mostly close to tourists, and it will reopen next week. Yeah. That we have this privileged opportunity to see La Bucaria empty, which I think will never happen again. Yeah, actually, um, we are kind of happy right now because from next week onwards, we are kind of opening our restrictions for a bit, easing them, and we are very excited because we are, we are going to be able to um, eat dinner at a restaurant, for example, or, I don't know, maybe visit our friends in other yeah. regions. So it's very nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much thank for the tour, so Anna and Grace. Yes, for both of your time and joining us on the Solo Field Female Travel page. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Take care. See you soon. See you.
So cute. Awesome. Awesome. That was so nice to see La Bucaria, so empty, so unique, right? Like such a variety. I think that this never happens, right? I mean, La Bucaria is so empty. Usually you cannot even walk, right? (laughs) Uh, You cannot get around anywhere because there's just so many, so many people everywhere, right? So what we are going to do next is we are going to show you how to make pan tumaca, right? But before we do that, we are going to give you the ingredients. So in the next slide, I think we have a reminder of the ingredients. So Tahira will show you how to make pan tumaca yep. while I stay with you here. And if, you have, if you're at home, you should go and get your ingredients as well. So to make pan tumaca, which is the most typical and traditional Catalan dish, you need bread, ideally some sort of chapata or like sourdough or some sort of like rustic bread. Um, and then you need to have um, uh, some tomatoes, some really ripe tomatoes. And then you need to have uh, some olive oil um, and then some salt. So that's all you need. So bread, sourdough or like crunchy, basically it's to be like crunchy in the outside and like soft, moist in the middle. And then you need some tomatoes, ripe tomatoes, ideally the ones that you saw on the screen, but if you cannot find that, then some very ripe tomatoes, some extra virgin olive oil and a little bit of salt to make this very nice, very traditional Catalan dish that you are going to see now, Tahira show you how to make. We have been bringing the the ingredients with that and we have prepared all the table. And so now you're gonna be able to to see it. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for Tahira, I am going to show you again the video for the months, uh, what we eat in Catalonia every month. And you're going to be able to recognize some of the fruits and vegetables and the things that Ana and Grace were showing you in La Bucaria. So we have extra virgin uh, Borges olive oil. Borges is a Catalan company. They have lots of olive trees in the area which we saw yesterday. We have very nice ripe tomatoes. Yes, perfect. Very ripe, very shiny, very pretty. And like the little ones that she's going to use that she has cut into two halves. Yes. And then we have bread. So. <laughs> And garlic, because Tahira likes garlic. So when you make pan tomaca, you don't, I don't never put garlic, but some people like to put garlic into it. So you would, you would basically just like, yeah, like, like, yeah, exactly. Like wrap the garlic on the bread and then you would do it just like that. And then you would put the tomato on top if, uh, if you know, if you like the garlic, but if you don't like garlic, you go straight into the tomato. So you brush it. Exactly. So you just brush the tomatoes and you're smearing the tomato paste, the tomato pulp on the bread, right? Yes, perfect. And then you put some a generous amount of olive oil. It has to be extra virgin olive oil because it has to be like the really flavorful, really tasty one. And there you go, your pam tomacat, right? Like that's basically pam tomacat. And then to go with the pam tomacat, we would usually have that for breakfast, as you saw Alex and Seth doing it, right? Yes. So you would basically pinch of a salt if you're going to put a lot of like cured yeah and this salt is a very special salt um a little bit further down tahira so that we can see it yes so this salt is from the rocco brothers right it's a special salt that they made with uh, some herbs you can use normal um salt right like rock salt is better than than just like plain cooking salt you sprinkle a bit of it and then you put some um some ambutit which in this case is some beautiful yunganisa and some cheese because tahira loves cheese and then you put it over it and then you eat it like that that's how you would make pan tomacat I'm, I'm, i think that that's what tahira is doing right now eating the pan tomacat keep some for me for later but basically that's that's 
the most typical, the most traditional Catalan food, right? That's just pan tomacat. So to recap, you just have nice crunchy bread that you, we have toasted it so that it's crunchier because we prefer it like that. You can also do it fresh like Alex and Seth were doing earlier. And then you just near the tomato over it, put some olive oil, some salt, and then you can see how it looks like. And then you put whatever like a cured meats on top and then you have your like, it can be breakfast, it can be lunch, it can be dinner. With my family, this is what we used to do. We used to have a plate of embutis, of like cured meats and cheeses on Friday evening, lots of toasted bread with uh, tomato and olive oil, and that was dinner for Friday night. We would probably also make like a potato omelet um, as we were doing this. So that's your um, that's your pan tomacat. So what did you think? Did you like the pan tomacat that we just made? It's really like about the most simplest thing there is in the world. Sesc and Alex are the co-founders of Aborigines, which is a um, travel, a culinary travel uh, company in Catalonia. And they are going to tell you a little bit more about Catalan food. They've recorded this specifically for you today. They couldn't join us live, but they've recorded this just this morning so that you can watch them walking you through traditional Catalan foods for breakfast. So let's have a look at that. Hola, buen día. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are Cesc and Alex from Aborigines in Barcelona. Uh, well, welcome to our beautiful city. We are enjoying an open air breakfast this morning, and we want to show you a little bit what we eat in our country with some products we've been collecting in the past week. Um, that's what we do for a living. Uh, we both run a company called Aborigines, specialized in culinary travel. Uh, for people like you who enjoy culture, exploring countryside, and getting to know the country in depth. So I'm gonna let Seth explain you what we have said here today. Yeah, just because the designing uh, our trips, we spend uh, a lot of time traveling around Catalonia, meeting food artisans, producers, farmers, wine growers. So during the past week, we've been just visiting some areas less known and uh, far away from, from the city, from Barcelona. And in our way back to here, we just collect and gather some products we thought that may be interesting for you to know as a basic of our cuisine, of our day-to-day uh, -day diet. And it's simply, it's basic, and it's clean. Some of the products we share with other nations of the Mediterranean, and we hope you you will enjoy as well here. So we can start with the... Yeah, this is probably the last product we we got this week. Uh, we were down south to Terra Alta. Uh, it's one of the most remote uh, wine regions in Catalonia, almost at the border with uh, with Aragó. And we met Francesc. He, he's a, a young winemaker who runs a tiny, tiny winery with his brother and, and father. So what they mainly grow in this area is uh, Garnacha and Cariñena. So this is the coupage of both grapes. It's a, it's a young wine, but it's quite fruity and interesting. So we really like the, the value of, this, of these wines they make. And today, you, you'll see we don't have glasses here, because with this kind of meal, what we like to do is to drink it straight from, from that, from that curro. Yeah, usually in the wine country, during the grape harvest season, people was having breakfast in this way, with a traditional bread and some wine. But instead of using uh, glasses, they're using here what we know as a, as a puro, and was the traditional way of drinking wine, sharing in the countryside, uh, in a casual way, for young wines like, like this one. And, uh, They're going to need to wait until the, until the end of the <laughs> video to see how it's done. So uh, this town, this particular town we visited, is called Curvera Debra. Uh, it's known also uh, I mean, mainly for the wine, but especially because it was one of the last chapters of the Civil War. So it's a special place for, for some of us. And you can still see some of the heritage of the, the Batalla de Lebra, the, the battle that happened uh, there before the national side came up to Barcelona. Uh, well, no more history, <laughs> but we're going to go uh, now to cheese. On the way back to the city, we visited Frederic in La Llacuna. It's a small town uh, between Panades, another wine region, and Anoya. So what he makes is uh, sheep's cheese which the milk he gets from some neighbors, some farmers. And with this cheese that you can see that it's quite aged, we make another product that we will explain to you later. Later on. The thing is that it's a 
Uh, Catalonia is a small country and just a few hours from Barcelona it's easy to get deep in the middle into the countryside and uh, those landscapes are the traditional Catalan landscapes from the south it's olive trees, almond trees and vines and uh, it's easy just a uh, half an hour outside Barcelona to meet some of these artisans escaping for the most uh, touristy uh, tracks um, so just not far between these two, these two producers, we we went to visit uh, another new project uh, based in olive oil in Las Garrigas, one of the smallest also areas in in Catalonia known for being a, a rural area famous for the olive oil. It's the the first one in Spain with a, an appellation of origin for the olive oil, and this is a new project in Albages. It's a people that have been recovering 60 hectares of um, olive trees. Uh, from the variety called Arbequina, which is the most common, uh, more, most common here. And then the three basics are the ones we use in our day-to-day, -day, or mostly for, for breakfast. And uh, to go with, we're gonna eat some of this uh, bread. This is traditional pada pages, which is also a product now with a, an appellation of origin made with a local wheat. And uh, it's just few, few, uh, uh, bakers are still making it and this one we like because it's just here in Barcelona in the Raval in the city center which uh, some people think that uh, you need to escape sometimes from the city uh, to meet these uh, traditional products but in this case not it's just no. run around the corner exactly and another good example are these tomatoes mm. that they are grown right here in Coisarola just 30 minutes from this location right now is a local association of farmers in Coisarola near Tibidabo, the amusement park. It's also a project with wines and olive trees, uh, but in this case is a, a guy uh, with a small cooperative. They have recovered a uh, tomacat mando, it's a tomato ground for salads, and then this tomato that is called uh, tomacat de panjá, uh, tomacat petit mando it's called, and it's just uh, used for for dressing the, the bread, as Alex will... No, I'm fine. <laughs> we can make it. I mean, I'm here for the breakfast, not for, <laughs> for the talk, so... It's very simple, no? We are a country of peasants. It's true that at the same time, Barcelona is known for having this uh, high-end cuisine, all the molecular revolution that took place in El Bulli and big chefs, high-end places. But we like to, we enjoy more when... Uh, when we introduce people to some of these products that, because it's a way, a way for you to understand who we are, why we eat what we eat, our history, our tradition, and just behind every single product, there is a, a story about uh, families, about people, about landscapes, products, tradition, habits. And yeah, and those are the projects we like to, to introduce you to, because they, they have a, a history, they have a meaning, uh, they focus on, I mean, they make a living of that, of course, but they still have a soul in those projects. So we like to promote these small artisans that keep making the same products that define Catalan cuisine. And this is just a sample of what we make. You, you won't see here any, any fish, and fish is a, a big part of our diet, but every region has their own specialties. And that's why we like to travel to all of them. So you get to know these uh, well, regional specialties, dishes that they, they are still cooked in just one particular town, for instance, uh, from the Pyrenees to the coast of Girona. So every single region has a, a reason to, to be visited. Yeah, just shepherds, fishermen, travel in winter, and it's a, a good way, and it's just outside the city, uh, literally. So it's just a, a special occasion to discover uh, Catalonia behind uh, the Gaudí monument, behind the, the famous highlights. Well, those are worth to visit. Worth to visit, of course. But since our specialty is food and, and wine. We like eating and drinking. Exactly, so. well, yeah, <laughs> that's another good reason. So I'm just slicing some lunganisa. This is a cured meat made of pork, like pork loin, fat, pepper, salt, simple recipe that comes from the, the Roman period. And it's the easiest way to, to cure meat with so, the making the same yeah. way. It's a way to preserve the, the meat here as a Catholic country. Pork was a, um, a big, big, uh, basic ingredient in, in our diet. And it's just simple as a slicing some yunganisa, getting the olive oil. Just. 
with the bread and tomato and one for me one for you <laughs> it's still more early in the morning and it's our breakfast time so we, we are sorry for you but we're gonna get some some bread and um and this is something i really want to, mm. to tell them about it's a unique cheese made in catalonia that tell us about who we are we are a country of peasants nothing is wasted in this case you get the the cheese that is almost rotten and it's gonna it won't be used and you add the grappa or the alcohol some spirit the olive oil okay so after the tupi uh it's time for the wine let's show them how it's done yeah i started when i was five so i don't say that you keep your skills yeah uh, thank you everyone for watching. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in Barcelona very soon to explore Catalonia okay. and get to taste some of these products with us. We hope we can just work uh, in the future with uh, Solo Female Travel. We hope to see you here in Barcelona to eat, to drink and to have fun. Salud! Bye! Adeu! Wow, how amazing is that? Wouldn't you want to sit there, right there with Alex and Seth, to enjoy some amazing pam tomacat, to enjoy some beautiful olive oil, some wine. Did you see him drinking from the Purro? Uh, I think that, you know, just to repeat the word Purro, P-O-R-R-O, that's what you used to drink. My father also has that. If you go to the countryside in Catalonia, you're definitely going to see people drinking wine with that. And that, those were, as Alex and Seth recorded this little video for all of you to see how to eat proper breakfast and you saw how crunchy and moist the bread was and we are going to talk about wines because our next visit today is familia torres winery so we have a very special private tour of the winery which is uh it's more than 100 years old it's on the fifth generation and this family winery has makes wines in quite a few places around catalonia and so as you can see from the map in catalonia we have 12 wine and cava denominations, appellations of origin. Those are the regions that you can see colored on the map. So each of these little colors is a different region of wine producing uh, region or cava producing region. Barcelona is on, you know, kind of like north of the dark green. So that would be like Barcelona. And so the nearest region to Barcelona is the Penedès region, which is also the region where cava is made. Primarily, cava can be made in other places, but primarily cava is made in the Denominación de Origen Cava, in the Appalachian Cava, and that's the region, Panadés region that's most near to, to Barcelona. And so you can see that we, have, we grow wines in many different places in Catalonia, right? That's why you are never too far from good wine. And so we have this beautiful, um, nice little private tour of Torres Winery with Mark who is also going to talk to you a little bit about olive oil, because olive oil is also a very traditional Catalan um, you know, a product that we grow, we grow olives and we make uh, this olive oil with Arbequina olives that Mark will tell you about. And you will also learn how to taste wines. And in the end, Mark will also show you his way of making pam tomacat because you can never be too far from pam tomacat in Catalonia. All right, so we are uh, live from Familia Torres Wines and I'm here with uh, Mark Colling. So Mark, how are you? Very good, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you here in the Penedès region in Familia Torres. Well, I wish I was there with you, definitely. So, uh, Mark, uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit and tell us more about Familia Torres Wines? Yes, um, my name is Mark Colling. I uh, actually uh, work in developing the, the business and also uh, attracting, promoting the activities, the experiences in this beautiful landscape. Um, we are surrounded by vineyards. Familia Torres is a centenary company. It's five generations, and it was established back in 1870. Uh, it's, a, it's a winemaking family that uh, actually has been making wines and has established from this region of Penedès in other regions as well of Catalonia. Uh, I would say this is the most emblematic vineyard. It's Mas La Plana, and we will really, really, really be happy to share it with you. Uh, as soon as we can. Well, I really definitely hope that I can go to see you again, like I did last year in January, um, anytime soon. So today you're going to show us a little bit around and we're going to have a look at the vineyards in this beautiful day that we are very lucky with the weather. Yes, um, it's, it's, uh, it's true. So what we are going to show you is actually what you see when you come. This is our visitor center 
we welcome our guests and then we uh, go into the winery. First of all, obviously, we explain the very origin of a wine, which is the grapes, um, is, the, is the material that we work with. And it's very, very important uh, to do it properly. Obviously, um, it is a little bit like in the kitchen. If you have very fresh and good ingredients, your dishes are going to be marvelous. The same happens with wines. You need the best, the utmost quality of grapes. And for that, the work in the vineyard, the selection of the soil, then planting and growing the, uh, the vines and the grapes every season is, is like the key aspect, I would say. We're going to enter now the uh, visitor center. So please come with me. Here you can discover many things as well, such as the Familia Torres Wine Club, uh, which is not yet international, but we'll get there. Uh, we have like, you know, lots of different options in purchasing the wines, and we can even refer to the client where they can enjoy the wines, where they can purchase the wines in Southeast Asia. Um, visitor Center is an ideal place to, to enjoy wine. This is a region to enjoy wine. We are just 30 minutes south of Barcelona, and uh, in here we have different projects, such as La Carretera del Vi, where you can visit 13 different cellars, taste different wines in each cellar, and there is a passport that will get sealed. Obviously, you need a bit of time for that project, but let's have <laughs> a look. <laughs> well, if you have to visit 13 wineries, how many days do you think you need? Three days, well, four days? Yes, probably three or four days, and uh, hopefully you can do it in different visits. But yes, I would say three visits on a day is quite a lot, actually. So maybe four or five days, and then you can visit all the wines. And I think that if you visit them all, you get if you fill your passport, you also get a, a bottle or a, even a case of wine. Is it true? I think I remember That's reading correct. that. Exactly. That's the whole idea. So when you have visited the, the six first uh, uh, wineries, in, this, in the number six, regardless which one it is, you get a box of wines from uh, with a bottle of one in each, every winery that you have visited, actually. That's amazing, right? It's it a is. great incentive. It's like you visit six wineries and then you get a case. That's awesome. That's it. And then you've got uh, another six to visit. And then at the end, you get one single bottle. So it's 13 in total. Lucky number. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I wonder why thirteen. <laughs> it's just the, uh, it's just the, the community of wineries that uh, actually joined the project. You see, it's awesome. And today is a very quiet day, right? It's also in the morning, in the middle of the week. So in the weekends, Correct. I'm sure it's much more popular, right? Yes, actually, we have uh, lots of visits and uh, visitors as well uh, this weekend. So welcome to El Segeret. This is our restaurant, and this is the place we have this presentation I was telling you about. So we are uh, seeing here, for example, La Carretera del Vi. Oh, uh, you have the map there that we can have a look at. Yes. yes. So actually, we can visit the wineries. It's an old Roman road. And you can visit the wineries from inland down to the coast, coast in sieges. So <laughs> Which is where just, I'm from. Oh, yes, exactly, which is actually a beautiful place. And uh, they actually have the, the Hospital de Sitges is a winery that makes beautiful Malvoisie. Malvoisie is a white grape sort, and they make beautiful white wines out of this grape sort that grows along the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Malvoisie and Muscat are grape sorts that like the mild temperatures at the sea. So. Basically, making a wine, as I previously uh, told you and shared with you, has a lot to do with the climatology and the type of soil. So it's not the same in this area, for example, as in this central area or the very interior where it's cooler. Obviously, it's not massive differences, but it makes a difference. And it's the key for success in the quality of your grapes. That means it's the key in success for the quality in your wines. Right? So, uh, this is El Celleret. This is our restaurant and it's a garden as well. It's a place to enjoy the wines. 
Um, so, and the gastronomy, obviously. So our chef, our colleagues in the kitchen, but also our colleagues here in the room will prepare and serve you delicious meals with those wines that we are making as well. So that is, that is really an ideal program, I would say, to come in the morning, do a nice experience, visit those vineyards, and then enjoy gastronomy with the wines that we make here. And everything is very seasonal, right? You, the restaurant only serves whatever is in season. Yes, exactly. So we have seasonal um, products and also from the area, which we call uh, kilometer zero. That means that there is never a big distance. We get the fish from Sieges or Villanova, you know, from, from the nearest uh, fish markets. And then we have the meats from the area surrounding us. Well, the best uh, uh, beef, for example, is, is from Girona. So we get the, the, the chef gets the beef from Girona. But in general, the lamb, for example, is from San Martí, which is nearby. Or we have the Catalan rooster. Uh, we have also different seasonal vegetables, such as the calçots, uh, which is a typical, um, you know, gastronomical feature, I would say, in February, especially in winter. It's like an onion, and it's, it's quite a performance eating calçots. So always good with <laughs> a performance. I like that definition. <laughs> it was actually it's my favorite. Uh, you know, on Monday we talk about Catalan food and our favorite foods, and for me it's calçots because it's also something that you cannot find anywhere else. And most yeah. people like calçots not just for the onion itself, but for the sauce, right? For the romesco sauce. Absolutely, uh, romesco is one of the most uh, uh, versatile uh, uh, sauces, if you allow me. Uh, it goes very well with vegetables. I think. In my opinion, it's probably the best, but it suits as well fishes and it suits as well meats. So you can really play with these sauce. And we have very delicious wines to go with Romesco, such as Franzola, for example, which is one of the um, vineyards around us, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, beautiful white wine. Let me show you. Uh, we have here beautiful views, Mark. It's actually a, a, a mild landscape. I always uh, think uh, a little bit uh, of the... Uh, of the Tuscany, I would say it's, it could be a reference, but the Penedès uh, is, is such a, a beautiful area, so close to Barcelona, so close to Sitges, just so close to the Mediterranean Sea. So this is the, the vineyards of Mas La Plana. And uh, in here you can uh, discover as well during the visit, the different uh, types of grape sorts. Also, if you come with your family, you can visit our sheep over there. The sheep is actually an animal that is used by the shepherd as well to eat the weeds. And it, it forms part of the whole cyclus of feeding the land. So the animal gets the weeds and leaves actually what feeds the plants behind, you see? It's fertilizing, basically. Exactly, that's it. I think what, what makes this experience very, very attractive is actually the fact that you can be outside, uh, you can be in an open uh, space, and you breathe and you experience the vineyard, the vine, from very, very close. I mean, literally from August until October, you can even taste the grapes if you want. See? Yeah. Very nice. So, uh, thank you. So, uh, I would like to invite you to our <laughs> wine museum. And from there, we're going to go to the tasting. And then we'll make something very, very Catalan. It's a special <laughs> Catalan speciality we're going to make for you. Awesome, now I, I really wish I was there though. So, welcome to the Fundación Miguel Torres. This is uh, the social work. This is actually a project where uh, Familia Torres is constructing orphanages around the world. They constructed nine orphanages, um, but it's also a museum. Yeah. And this is the, the part that you can see as a visitor with all these tools, you know. These are actually tools and this is uh, the heritage as well. So you see on one hand how the wines have been made over history, but you see as well the history of Familia Torres, which is over 150 years old. Let me show you over there. We've got the Roman amphoras and uh, that is how... Romans would transport wines from this region to the Mediterranean and trade with the wines. These are the amphoras.
Let's see if we can see them from closer by. Yes. This actually, Roman Empress. How old are they? So basically, How old are they? Oh, they're 2,000 years old, Mar, and they would be sealed with a cork and bee wax around. So basically, wow. they have been, yes, they have been found fished from the sea bottom. They were in the sea bottom over 2,000 years, um, and they are from Roman and Italic, and some are even from Greek origin. So that is how the exportation of wines took place in those days. And that is the very origin of winemaking for the region of Penedès, probably one of the oldest winemaking regions. Um, it's Another cool to see, right? Like, it's cool that this is how... So the wine was being made still in the same place, and then they were filling them in these amphoras, and they were putting the cork and the beeswax uh, as a seal, and then putting them on a ship, right? Like, laying down, and then transporting it to the rest of uh, the Mediterranean. Exactly, and, and trade it. But it was not only wine, it was also olive oil. So there were, like, different products. We are going to show you as well a little bit about the olive oil. That is our next stage. So we have different ingredients in Catalan cuisine. And one of the very relevant ingredient is the olive oil. But it's made with an olive that's typical from Catalonia and it's called Arbequina. It comes from a village that is called Arbeca. And it's a very fine oil. It's very subtle and very elegant. So it's part of our Gastronomy is part of the ingredients in our gastronomy, and we're going to share that with you as well. Oh, and arbequinas are very, very small olives. Like people may be thinking about olives as in like the olives that you eat, but actually arbequina olives are really, really small. They are very tiny, I mean, yeah. and the bone yeah. is almost the majority of the olive, so there's very little olive in an arbequina yeah. olive. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Uh, they are very, very peculiar uh, uh, olives, but they are the majority uh, in Catalonia. So it's the, the, the olive sort that is most widely grown in Catalonia and very characteristic for Catalonia as well. Mark, uh, let me introduce you to a beautiful sparkly wine that we make. Uh, it's called Vardon Kenneth, and it's very exclusive. Um, actually, uh, this is a, a wine that is made with uh, three grape sorts. Uh, one of them is, is, a, is a traditional wine, it's the Charello. But the other two ones, which are actually in a larger percentage, are Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, sparkling wine. It's not a Cava, actually, but uh, it is actually the same principle. So that means we make a white wine like this one, and then we put it in the bottle, adding a little bit of sugar, and then the bubbles start, you know, being created, you see? Uh, well, we get rid of that little sugar or little sweet uh, uh, yeast that we add actually. And we put, we put a cork and we seal it like you, like you see. Um, it's a delicious white wine. So Baden Kennedy is a place to visit and is a wine to enjoy. I really, really recommend it. It's very, very elegant. And one of the I, qualities of uh, sparkly uh, wines is that you can have breakfast, you can have lunch, or you can you can have dinner with them. You see, I well, think, I think it's a great good. recommendation. You know, you start breakfast with sparkling wine or cava, and then you continue yeah. for lunch, and then you yeah. have it in the afternoon, and then you have it for dinner. Perfect exactly. recommendation, Mark. I think you understand the good life. This is for holiday. You see, it is for holidays. <laughs> Let me just introduce you to a, a beautiful white wine. Uh, it's the Viña Esmeralda. And Viña Esmeralda is a wine that is made with muscat. So that is a grape sort that is uh, growing in the coastal areas next to sieges. And uh, it's very aromatic. Oh, it's beautiful. It, it, it's really very grapey. You recognize the aroma, it's beautiful aroma, it's very fresh. So when we taste the wine, we actually go through three phases. The first one is the visual. So we use natural light and we look at the color of the wine with a white 
uh, background so we can really see the color, you know, optimally, you see? So the color of a white wine tells us about how this wine is made. And maybe sometimes it can tell us about the age, but mostly about how it's made. So in this case, we have a light, quite pale color. So that means it's a young wine. You recognize a wine by through its color. Don't forget, this is a matter of tasting and experience. In the end, what's most important is how you enjoy it. If you really enjoy it and you really like it. Um, and sometimes you need to give it a second chance. But anyway, the second phase is the nose. So what we do is smell the wine. Well, basically to describe, to figure out when you smell this wine, it smells very sweet. It smells very grapey because it's muscat and that's a very aromatic grape sort. Riesling is another very aromatic grape sort. Sauvignon Blanc is another very aromatic grape sort, you see? So we, we smell really the grapes, yeah? When we swirl the glass, and we can do it like this, we are opening the aromas of the wine. So we are actually releasing some of the molecules, they come free, and then we smell it. And we can even perceive more, a wider spectrum of the aromas of the wine, you see? And then finally, we taste the wine. It's our palate that gives us the information about, is it a sweet wine? Is it an off dry wine? So medium, or is it a, a dry wine, completely dry wine, you see? But also, is it a wine that lasts a long time in your mouth? Or is it rather brief, you know, the aftertaste as we call it? So we look, we swirl, Mm, now I kind of, I'm jealous. I'm jealous that I don't have a glass of uh, Vigna Esmeralda I'm with sorry. me. <laughs> okay. We'll send you a bottle right away. <laughs> Perfect. Mm. And then we taste the wine. So normally, uh, this type of wine doesn't have a very strong aftertaste. So that means it's a perfect wine for an aperitif. You can drink it just in the glass. Uh, in good company, with friends. When it's warm weather, it's perfect because it's very refreshing and it's a low alcohol content. This exactly 11.5%. Uh, so you can so drink the I, whole bottle and not be completely drunk. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a, to me, I think it's a very good wine with um, uh, risotto, with mushrooms, if you like that, or um, sushi you know, raw fish, it's a very good combination. Uh, or as I say, it's just a perfect aperitif wine. It's just very nice to enjoy on its own. Yeah? Mm, delicious, really nice, very attractive, very feminine as well. Good, then we go for the second wine, and this is Gran Coronas. It's one of my favorites, and it's a classic wine. It's a classic Torres wine. Um, we were talking today, Mark, in our presentation about the vineyards of Mas La Plana around us. Well, Mas La Plana is where we made the first Gran Coronas. Actually, the Familia Torres made uh, uh, Tempranillo grapes traditionally. But then back in the 70s or late 60s, Mr. Torres, the fourth generation, wanted to make a Cabernet. Uh, to be allowed to do so, uh, he actually was supposed to win a competition so he was meant to present a wine made out of this new grape because you must uh, think that uh, 40 or 50 years ago, we did not have any grape sorts from France or any other place. So it was like the local indigenous grape sorts, I would say. That's quite an interesting aspect as well about wine, that we have grape sorts from around the world, but it's the will, obviously, of the winemaker. Anyway, they started making the Gran Coronas, which is... Cabernet Sauvignon, a grape sort from France, and Tempranillo, a traditional Spanish grape sort that is called Ull de Llebre, Hars Eye, in Catalan. It's a beautiful combination of two red grape sorts. And in this case, it's a wine that is 12 months in contact with the oak. So, and Gran Corona can be found everywhere, right? Like you export this wine to pretty much anywhere in the world. Exactly, Mark. This is the, the reason for me to introduce you to these two wines, because you will be able to find our wines in Singapore, for example. Uh, our distributor is Culina in this case. Well, um, in any case, this is a, 
a beautiful red wine as well. Um, again, we need a, a, a background that is white and natural light as well. And what we see, and uh, is actually, I need to put this white wine aside. Sorry about that. What we see is that this wine has uh, quite a deep color. So that means that uh, it still is fairly young. Well, we can always look on the vintage, and the vintage, this is 2016. So it is already nearly five years ago that they picked the grapes actually to make this wine. So uh, the date on the label is when the grapes were picked. And from then to the day nowadays is the process of making the wine. You see, sometimes it can be a while in the retail, I would say, in the shelf, right? But not too long, actually. So anyway, this wine was made with grapes from 2016. And what they did is actually crush the grapes. In the case of the white wine, they press the juice, but the skins are not relevant because white grape sorts don't have as much color, but red grape, red grape sorts do have a lot of color. And what the winemaker does is actually extract the color. So when you have a Cabernet or when you have a Tempranillo or Ulda Llebre, normally you have a very intense wine. So you can read the grape sort, you can read as well the age. The more years, the color goes down. So if we would have here a red wine from the 70s, which is when they started making these Masla Plano wines, it would be very pale and you can just see it. That's you know why we look at the wine, you see? But that's tasting, eh? it's experience, I would say. That's, that's what it takes. Eh? Taste a lot of wine and then you will definitely you know, be able to recognize. And sometimes you're mistaken, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's normal. <laughs> so we uh, experience the aromas of the wine. And if you are not used to swirl the glass like this, because it's a bit uncomfortable, you can do it as well on the table. Um, I like to smell the wine when it's quiet. And again, when you swirl the wine, you get more molecules free. So you get a wider spectrum of the different aromatic compounds of this wine. I can smell the barrel. So I can smell vanilla. I can smell toasted flavors. I can smell some spiciness to it even some jammy fruit. So it's quite quite concentrated. Uh, again, you don't find these aromas as easy because you must remember the aromatic spectrum. So what is in the range of fruits, what is in the range of herbs, what is in the range of spices. So if you train yourself, you train your memory, and then you train your nose, and then you can define the wine. But again, it's not the most important part. I think the most important is to enjoy the wine, really enjoy it. So, yes. You're the best wine. Somebody once told me that the best wine is the one that you like. Exactly. That's true. And actually, wow, this wine uh, is more astringent. That means that it dries your tongue a little bit. It's elegant, but obviously it ha it's powerful. So we should enjoy this wine with some food. It could be some uh, different types of cheeses. The, I would say the cured ones, you know, this Manchego style. We have here in Penedès some wine, uh, some cheese makers are actually quite good, actually. Goat or, or, or sheep, uh, the, the sheep cheese would be a very good combination. Also uh, the meats or the stews. Even if you make vegetarian food and you're making like a spicy curry, for example, I think that could be a good match for uh, for uh, the Gran Coronas. It's very personal and how you enjoy the wines, in reality, there's no rules, no golden rules. There's recommendations, but it's very personal. And uh, that's where it comes down to, I think. That's the most important. And again, sometimes you might feel like, oh, this wine, mm, maybe a bit too harsh, a bit too strong. Maybe it's you, it's not the wine, you see? then you give it a second chance or you taste it in another moment and maybe your perception is quite different and you really love the wine, you see? That's quite amazing about wines as well. It's like you're talking about the person. Yes. <laughs> the if perception. You don't like someone, but then maybe it's not you, maybe it's not the other person, maybe it's you, you know? Yes, exactly. I like, maybe that, I like that. Yeah. Good, Mark. Uh, we've got one more uh, aspect I would really love to share with you. And this is actually 
the recipe, the Catalan recipe I was telling you about, mm. is, it's actually pan tomacat. And that pan is- Pan tomacat. Pan tomacat, yes. Oh, it's so like my most favorite food. Is it? Oh, well, I love it as well. And actually what we have for pan tomacat is uh, three basic ingredients, well, four, and we could have a fifth one, but that, that adds a, a little extra power. Let me tell you, we need a little tomato. We call these ones tomaco. And the tomaco is, or tomaco, tomaco actually. On tomaco. <laughs> uh, tomaco is actually a, a, a special tomato that has very thin skin. So it's very suited to make pan tomacat. I think you need to show it closer so that we can see it. Yes. Okay. Show, me the, so, show me the tomaco oh. that I haven't seen in such a okay. long time. Yes. So this is a tomaco, you see? It's a tiny it's tomato. And, and it's, it's also very ripe, right? Very soft. Very soft and very ripe. Yeah, you can, you can, you know, it's very, you know. You wouldn't eat you it can... in a in a salad. No, it's, it, and it's not that flavorsome for salads. I think this is really for the tomato bread because it balances the flavor of the olive oil and the salt. Well, let me show you. So we cut the tomato in half, right? It's quite an easy recipe, and then. We take one half of the tomaco and a slice of bread. Well, this is quite important as well because this is a, a, a bread that we call pa da coca. It's a thin bread. And as you can see, uh, our chef has toasted lightly this bread. That's the perfect pan tomaco, in my opinion. There might be can, other can recipes. You show, can you show me the bread from closer by? You cannot, I cannot get this bread in Singapore. It's a bit oh. like... A, it's a bit it's a, like... It, it, Chapata, you know, like a chapata, the, yes. I mean, like exactly. a chapata. You can get a chapata. That's perfect. That's that's more or less about the same. It's just uh, this this pan is, is is a bit lighter. Chapata is a bit more dense, but it doesn't matter. Chapata is a perfect option, absolutely. Yeah. So we take and then you cut it in the, half, right? You cut it like lengthwise in the middle before you toast the bread. The yes, bread you exactly. cut it in like you slice it in the middle and then you toasted it. Exactly, exactly. So the bread is, is like this. So this is the whole the whole loaf, you see. And then we cut it in thin stripes. And then we cut it through the middle. And we have two halves. So the idea, this is a companion for uh, cured ham, uh, for cheeses as well. It's a companion for aperitifs, for tapas as well. So we can rub the tomato. We could rub as well garlic, but that makes it more stronger, you know, it more intense. So pan tomaca originally is with the tomato on the bread. And what we do is literally rub the tomato. Can you see it? I think you need to get closer. Okay. <laughs> get closer to the camera and show us the, the, the technique of rubbing tomato technique. on bread. Exactly. There is a secret technique to that. Yes. <laughs> uh, lots of love, very important. Uh, uh, carefully you, you you smear the tomato and then you get the tomato smeared over the bread like this, right? So then you lay your slice here on the plate and then you have an extra virgin olive oil such as the purgatory. That's a winery, but we make some olive wines, uh, olive oils, excuse me. So we make some olive oils as well uh, in purgatory and this is made with arbequina. So we spoke about the arbequina olive and this is actually a um, very, very special olive oil. So we rubbed the tomato and then we put the olive oil on top. You see? Very generous amount of olive oil. Yes. Um, yeah. And then we take a pinch of salt and we've got the pan tomacat. It's, like it's the easiest, best thing in the world. However, the difficulty is in finding the right bread the right tomatoes, which even in Spain is very hard to get, and yes. a very good extra virgin olive oil. That's it. That's exactly it. Um, it's all about ingredients. I think, you know, as we saw today in the visit, the quality of the grapes, the quality of the olives, but also of how the wines or the olives are made, makes the difference. And that is what makes the Amtumacat a delicious um, food, actually, to accompany us. We say the cured ham or some of the tapas. Uh, also the cold cuts, uh, you know, the lunganisa, for example, which is a beautiful Fuet. sauce. Yes, fuet, exactly. So we've got, you know, lots of different ingredients that we can combine and we can enjoy the pan to market with.
which is really quite an amazing uh, food. I love pan tomacat myself, so I'm a big fan of pan tomacat. Absolutely. It is the thing that I always eat when I go home. Yes, okay. <laughs> the very, very first nice. thing I eat is pan tomacat. Yes. <laughs> It feels you makes you feel like home, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it is at home because you cannot find the bread, the same olive oil, and the same tomatoes anywhere else, no matter how much you try. So it is great to have it at home, and then it just tastes different, like you say, right? The uh, um, wines always taste better when you're like in good company, when you're like sitting in the vineyard, when you're enjoying it with friends, and then it just it all just tastes so much better, right? That's it, absolutely, Mark. That's that's the whole you know idea, and it's the most important. It makes a uh, uh, it makes a difference, and it's what where it's made for, definitely. Yes. And I think um, Catalonia is perfect for that. It is perfect for that, absolutely. Yes. Beautiful nature, beautiful landscape, beautiful people, and beautiful ingredients. So I think we've got uh, all what's required to have a real fun, authentic, and beautiful holiday. So <laughs> welcome. I think you are a great ambassador, Mark, and um, well, I want to much. thank you. I want to thank you very much for taking us on a little tour of Familia Torres Wines, for thank showing you. us how to taste wines. Now everybody can go and like get a bottle of wine and, and try it out. And, you know, and the best wine is the one that you enjoy the most. And for showing us how to make pam tomacat, which is great yes. because you have the right ingredients. So yes. it is uh, fantastic for people to see the, the type of bread and, you know, the arbequina olive oil and the nice tomacon tomatoes to make it. That's it. Thank you very much, Mar, for uh, sharing with us, uh, for uh, uh, visiting us and for spreading as well the culture of wine and uh, gastronomy from Catalonia. Thank you. Uh, it has been a real pleasure. Thank you. And I hope to see you soon, Mark. Yes. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye. See, see you. Bye-bye. 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 So how about that? How much did you enjoy the little tour of Familia Torres Winery, you learn more about how to taste wine, how to drink wine, and how to make pam tomaca. This is the second, the third time today that you learn how to make pam tomaca. You first learned from, from Francesc and, and Alex, then you learned from Tahira and myself, who showed you right here how to make it. And now you just saw Mark making pam tomaca as well. I think that by now you realize that this is the most typical Catalan dish. But there is another very traditional Catalan dish that Tahira will show you right now. And Tahira is very near me. So together we are going to give you some instructions on how to make this very typical and also very like easy Catalan dish. So let's see, let me put Tahira on the spot she, so that she's like on most of the screen. And there we have Tahira. So to make escalivada, the most important ingredients are peppers, like capsicum peppers, like the ones that she can see. So it is about the simplest dish you can make because it really requires no preparation. So to start with, you have a pepper that you put it in an oven tray and then you just sprinkle some olive oil, like generously sprinkle olive oil on it, like make it like quite, yes, exactly, very good, Tahira. And then I don't like to put any salt. I just literally put it like this in the oven. So with this, we would basically put it in the oven and keep it there for like, depends on your oven, right? Something like 45 minutes at around 160 degrees Celsius. And then you get this. You get this version. I also put aubergines because usually um, scalivada is made with peppers and aubergines and onions. And so you would put the three. And so Tahira is showing you how to peel it. So you literally, because it's been cooked so well, you literally just peel the skin just comes out with your fingers. You don't need a knife or anything. So you would literally be peeling the skin out of it. Yes, exactly. And you would discard the skin. And the same with the aubergine, right? You would literally just pinch the skin and just like peel it. And I also like to discard the seeds of the aubergine. Well done, Tahira. I think that you can you can see how easy it is that she literally just with her hands peels the, the aubergine and the peppers. And, and it's quite easy because it's been cooked so nicely. So it's soft. It, it has to be very soft and very tender so that you can easily eat it, right? Yeah, exactly. You can see how like tender it is and how nice. And, and you can use, oil. you can eat the oil that has come out and like kind of like digested in the oven and soak bread in it as well. Yes, absolutely. There's nothing like dipping, soaking bread on whatever sauce or olive oil comes out of it. And then once you've peeled it all, we put it here nicely so that you can see it uh, on display. We put it on a nice tray, different colors because we cook like, yellow, green, and red peppers. And then the aubergine is in the middle. And I also had baked some onions, which is the white parts that you can see. So that's basically a scalivada. And how do we eat a scalivada? Yes, exactly. Look at it, how it ties in it. 
how I like tasty and, and healthy it is. And you basically just take a piece of bread and put some escalivada on top of it. And if you want, you can add some like, I don't know, fuet or something like that. Some salt, a pinch of salt. I think that you can be more, exactly, some fuet. You can be more generous and put more escalivada. Obviously, this is like personal choice, right? I like to basically cover my whole bread with escalivada. And on top, people also like to put some anchovies sometimes uh, on top of the escalivada. We toasted some bread. It's a chapata, so it's not really like the, the pada vidra that Mark was showing you, but it's quite close to it. And basically, you just eat it. So you saw today with the pam tomacat, you can put, see how nice it is, the escalivada. How, how good is that? It's vegan, it's super healthy, it's very low in calories, and it's just very good for you, right? You just need peppers, which you can find anywhere. So I hope that you have been inspired to try at home and to make your own escalivada. <laughs> Thank you, Tahira. So actually, the picture on the right was a picture that, uh, you know, of escalivada. It wasn't my own picture, but then I was inspired to make the same escalivada myself um, to make it look the same, right? So then you can see how easy it is to make escalivada. And to recap, you just get peppers, you get aubergines, you sprinkle quite some olive oil around it, you put it in the oven, you cook it for 45 to 55 minutes at 160 degrees, more or less, depending on your oven, Celsius. So if you're in Fahrenheit, you're going to have to convert that. I'm not quite sure what the conversion is. And you get it out, you let it cool, and then you peel it with your hands. In the middle, you'll find the seeds, so you can scoop them out with a spoon and then put it nicely in a tray, and it will keep for quite a few days in the fridge. When you're ready to eat it, you can eat it with anything. You can accompany it over a toast. You can put it on salads. You can pretty much eat escalivada with many different things. So um, Tahira is back with me. She, How do you think she did? I think she, you did a great job, Tahira. <laughs> how was your experiment of making uh, some uh, Catalan escalivada? It did was you beautiful, enjoy? yeah. I really like the colors and how it got darker and richer after it was cooked in the oven. Yes, and you know, and to go with it, we have our glasses of wine from yeah. Torres, right? Yep. From the ones that Mark just, uh, just explained to you. So cheers. cheers. We're going to enjoy our nice escalivada and our bread, and uh, bread with tomato, pam tomacat, after this, um, after this presentation and this session with you. And we welcome you all to try to make pam tomacat and or escalivada or both. You can also make pam tomacat and put some escalivada on top of it. And like I have been doing every day, I will finish with a video of the Grand Tour of Catalonia. And a reminder that tomorrow is our last day of our tour around Catalonia the secrets beyond Barcelona. And we're going to go to Girona, yeah, yeah. Girona to watch, to see Thames the Flaws, which is a flower festival that's starting on Saturday. So we have a sneak preview into the festival. Um, and also we are going to go to Costa Brava. So that is how the week is gonna end. The week is gonna end on the beach, yeah. by the sea, hearing the sound of the waves and dipping our tones in the water and you know, on the sand of the Mediterranean coast of La Costa Brava. So I hope to see you all tomorrow. and. Stay tuned for more. And today I'm leaving you with the Grand Tour of Catalonia. See you tomorrow. You guys. Welcome to a land of short distances and long trails. Within a few hours from the Mediterranean waves and the peaks of the Pyrenees, the rice of the Delta, the anchovies of La Scala, or the mountains of Prades, of the lush Monsen. Welcome to a small land to travel across, but great to discover. Made of water, wind, fire and snow. Of age-old stones and landscapes to wonder. Trails where time stops and so many other spots to discover. The pleasure of taking the longest path and sneak into a secondary road. Look around you with fresh eyes. Valleys, mountains, rivers and fields. Bell towers and cellars, orchards and dry farms. Taste the most admired gastronomy, smell the colorful fruit trees. Admire a heritage cherished throughout centuries and traditions that cross generations. Welcome to a great adventure next to home. Welcome to a journey full of journeys. Welcome to the Grand Tour of Catalonia.